It's still in your PowerPoints. I did not pull it out of PowerPoints uh, on purpose. Food poisonings. It is in your first sec, no, your second section of PowerPoints. Food poisonings. We do not cover food poisonings in class. They are in Blackboard under your extra content of Module E. There is a uh, graph or diagram grid of those uh, foodborne illnesses. The biggest reason is um, many times these patients present very similarly with the different food poisonings. It's GI symptoms. Now the, the big deal is finding out what is causing the food poisoning. What uh, bacteria have they been exposed to? Um, so we don't cover food poisonings. And then the other one that we're not covering, but it is still in your PowerPoints, it's also in a grid in your extra content in Blackboard, is your illicit drugs. <coughs> your amphetamines, your hallucinogenics. Um, they're in the third set of PowerPoints as well. Um, I, I did leave the information in PowerPoints. I did put it in a chart format for you. I just don't cover those two in class. So do make sure you're going over those outside of class as well. So we are going to start with primary secondary surveys where we're going to start today. Get it pulled up for us. My day clinical board. Your folders are down in my box. I put them there last week. I just forgot to send you a reminder to tell you that they were there. Um, if you'll go by and sign your eval tool, pick your folder up and leave your eval tool for me. There, it's there. Microsoft Edge just wanted to update. Give me just a second. Uh -huh. 1 o'clock 2.30 well, 1.30 depending on you know <laughs> it depends on how well you work is right. what that depends <laughs> on if you think it's going to be 1.30 <laughs> alright it is going to come up do I need to close the blinds in the black back or y'all going to be able to see that oh get to lecture on emergency medicine. Um, this is my background. This is what I did at bedside um, for the 12 years as I was, that I was at bedside. Um, and so one of the big reasons that I like emergency medicine is I tend to be a very cut and dry, black and white type person. And to me, it's very methodical. There's a step, there's a process. 
And if that process is followed, you don't go wrong. You don't have to know everything that's going on with your patient. And by far, there were many times working in the ER as I had no clue as to what was going on with my patient, but I got to play detective. And I got to play detective to figure out what was going on with the patient. We stabilize them, and then guess what we do? Ship them out. Ship them out. We don't keep them. If there is like this four-hour window that they want them in and out, and they're going of one of a couple of places. They're going upstairs. They're discharging out of your facility or they're going to the morgue. That's where they're going. And so um, your goal is that they don't go to the morgue, but that happens. And so um, that's what I do like about the ERs because there is a process. There is this primary secondary survey that I'm going to spend probably the first hour and a half or so lecturing on. Um, and if you will follow your primary survey, you will find your life threatening problems um, without even knowing their life threatening problems initially. Our, my objectives are up. Again, please remember that you can use these to help you study. That is what we're covering in the class. It is a great outline. It also is a great way for you to study for what will be your final exam. So what separates emergency nursing from other types of nursing that we've talked about so far? Well, one of the big ones is time frame. We are taking care of patients we are doing rapid assessments and history takings of these patients. We are using a nursing process. <clears throat> and hopefully at this point in 203, you have figured out that that concept map that you dreaded doing for the first four semesters is really your way of thinking um, as you move into the field of nursing. You have to assess the patient. You identify the problem because that's why they're there. You have to come up with solutions to fix that problem. And then you also have to go back and go, okay, what I'm doing, is it working for the patient? And that's the evaluation. Does it work or does it not work? If it's not working, what are we going to do? We've got to change something or our patient's going to continue to decline. And that's what I love about the primary survey because it's exactly that same thing. And we're going to talk about that process over and over and over again. There is a lot of autonomy in emergency nursing. And there is a lot of critical thinking in emergency nursing. The part of that is, is it's easy to step out of your scope of practice in emergency nursing as well. So you have to know what your state says that you can and cannot do um, in the role of the nurse because it is easy to step out of that, especially in an area where you have a lot of autonomy. So triage is typically where patients start when they come into the ER. But what is triage? It's a classification or a sorting of patients. Did you know that the general population truly believes it is first come, first serve in emergency rooms? That if they signed in first, that they should be seen first? Um, and that is a huge misconception of emergency nursing. That is why we have triage nurses um, and they are essentially gatekeepers to your ER. Let me tell you something. Um, triage nursing is not for the faint of heart. You, units are locked down. They, you don't just have free access in and out of ERs anymore. Um, you are the sole person that the lobby sees 99% of the time when you're calling somebody back to do the initial assessment on them. You're doing that triage assessment and then guess what? You're having to make judgment calls as to who's going to be seen first and who's going to be seen last in this pile of patients that may be in that lobby waiting on you. Um, and let's face it, emotions run high. People don't come to the ER because it's a Sunday afternoon drive and they felt like stopping. People come to the ER because they're sick. They have family members that are sick. Many times they're wits ends. These mamas with babies that come in and they've been up 24, 48 hours, a baby that has cried, not holding anything down, they're dehydrated, they're miserable. Guess who else is miserable? Mom, dad, whoever's taking care of them is miserable as well. And so they're wits in and they show up to the ER expecting some help, some relief, somebody to give them an, a hand and then they come to find out they're waiting in the lobby for the next two hours. So then they're frustrated. And so you have lots of emotions that are carried in that emergency room in the, in the lobby that will escalate. And sometimes your triage nurse is just absolutely 
um, where that, that frustration gets taken out. Um, not that they're necessarily frustrated with the triage nurse themselves, but the process, the wait times. Uh, you are kidding yourself these days if you think you're going to go to an ER and not wait. There are very few people that don't wait. And we'll talk about this triage classification here in just a minute. Um, but our triage nurse uses protocols um, and an assessment to determine where the patient is put in um, order of being seen. So when we talk about protocols, what do we know about protocols? Somebody tell me something you know about a protocol. It does give you guidelines. Is it in order? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, yes, it is. A protocol is an order. There is a physician who has said, this is what we agree needs to be done for this type of patient. For example, now there are some things that we use and some things that we can't use. Um, for example, we see a lot of patients in the ER with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea type GI symptoms, whether it's food poisoning, whether it's a GI bug, whatever the case may be, we see a lot of people with those type symptoms. So we have protocols that say, okay, if the patient comes in with these type symptoms, you can start an IV, these are the two labs we want, this is, you can start a bolus of fluid, they can have four milligrams of Zofran IV. On there, they'll also put a CAT scan. Now a CAT scan, you cannot order over a protocol. You have to actually have a physician that says, yes, go ahead and order the CAT scan, or no, we're going to wait on the CAT scan. Um, that radiology study, that goes back to billing, that goes back to the patient, um, it being covered by their insurance, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, so you can't just order those, but there are things that are set aside that that group of physicians, typically your ER physicians, have said, okay, when the patient comes in with these type symptoms, this is what we want done for the patient, because guess what? Many times they will wait for those labs to come back before they'll ever even walk in the room to see the patient. Um, and so they're waiting on those things before the patient ever, before they ever see the patient. Things like kidney stones. We see a lot of patients with kidney stones. Kidney stones hurt. Patients are antsy. They can't sit still. You'll start IVs with the patient standing up dancing for you because they just, they're hurting. And so with patients with kidney stones, we have orders for IVs, for fluids, for pain meds. Um, those are the type orders that we have. For urinalysis, um, they all get strainers in case they pass the stone. So we have these protocols set in place so that we can actually start taking care of these patients before the physician actually sees them. When we talk about the different types of triage, there are lots of different types used in the country. Um, we are currently in this area using a five level ESI or um, severity index is what we are using. Uh, when I first started nursing, and I'm really not that old, I did graduate from nursing school in 2004. So um, when I started from in nursing in the emergency room, we actually used a three level system, this three tier system, and it was on paper and your entire assessment for the emergency room fit on a single sheet of paper. It was carbon copy, you kept the original for the chart, and you gave a patient a copy of it. Everything that had been ordered, your assessment, everything that was done, they got a copy of before they walked out of the ER that day. Um, it has since changed from that. But this three-level system, we've probably all heard of. When we talk about emergent, urgent, and non-urgent, and we just classify them into those kind of three categories. Um, they're very broad categories. There's nothing real specific about them. If you look at your emergent, it does say unstable vital signs. Hopefully, you and I know what an unstable vital sign is, but it doesn't give you parameters. It just says unstable. Um, and so that's kind of left to interpretation. When you move to a five-level system, and here it is um, in a grid format, I really like the algorithm much better. This is it. Um, I do love algorithms. And once you take ACLS and anything you can find in an algorithm, it's always easier to read in an algorithm. So you'll learn to love algorithms. But um, this is the same system in an, in an algorithm. And so where does it start? Ones are your most acute, where fives are your least acute. And now, as the nurse, taking care of or in triage, and by the way, triage is not the place for a brand new graduate, and we're going to talk about several reasons that's not. However, 
Every semester I walk into the ER and guess what I see? Brand new graduates running triage. Um, it's not going to change, but let's talk about why it's not the best place. One, because you don't have enough experience. That's the biggest reason. You have no clue as to what's going on um, on the billing side, on the charging side, on the reimbursement side. Um, you don't have enough life experience as a nurse to really run triage in the best interest of the patient. And I'll give you an example. I'd been out of nursing school probably four, maybe five years. I was in triage. Had an, an elderly lady, 86-year-old female, who came in with back pain. She had been in outpatient surgery the day before and had a thoracic discectomy. Single level, discharged home late the, the night before um, and did not get her pain medicines filled because the pharmacy was closed by the time her, husband, <coughs> her son took her to the house. So it's now a Saturday morning because that was done on Friday. It's now Saturday morning. It's about 10 o'clock and this little 86 year old female comes into the, to the ER complaining of back pain, thoracic back pain. So what did I do? I was being a great nurse. What did I assess? Like, the patient comes in with back pain. She had surgery yesterday. What are you going to assess? The site, right? You're going to assess the site. So what did I do? I opened up her shirt and I looked at her back. I even removed the dressing. Ooh, within 24 hours of surgery, I removed the dressing to see what the site looked like. It was not red. It wasn't draining. It didn't have an odor to it. It was nice and closed with glue. It wasn't even sewn together. It was a pretty incision. I'm like, why? She must just be hurting because she hadn't had her pain medicines filled, right? She's 86 years old. She hadn't had her pain medicines filled. So I made her a level four off of this system and put her in a fast track area. She was an acute MI fallout on me. Why? What did I miss? Atypical pain for a female for chest pain. What else did I miss? She was 86. And she is post op. Post op patients, especially with age, are at a higher risk of MIs because the stress of surgery will cause the patient to have a cardiac, cardiac arrest or a cardiac uh, infarct, an MI. So did I, I didn't think about doing a, an EKG on the patient at all, not at all did the thought of doing an EKG on the patient in triage cross my mind. Put her in the fast track area and nurse practitioner taking care of her who happened to have been my manager before she went back to practitioner school said, let's just do an EKG on her. Sure enough, she had some ST elevation on EKG. So she just went from what I thought was a level four to a level one in our triage. Um, was I diligent? Absolutely. Was I taking my time and assessing the patient? Yes, but I missed the forest for the trees because I got so focused on her being post-op and not having her pain medicine and looking at the site that I forgot the atypical symptoms of chest pain, especially in an elderly patient who had just had surgery. Um, and so those things happen. And hopefully you'll learn from my mistakes and you won't make those same mistakes yourself. But that's one of those examples of it just takes some experience to, to do triage. So then let's talk about the billing side of this. Um, now that I'm in administration, I'm just going to tell you that the billing side never meant anything to me at bedside. Now that I'm in the administrative side of, of the hospital, it, makes, it, it, it means something to me because... I now realize that if the facility is not billing and making money, guess what I'm not going to have? I'm not going to have a job. So it has to be billed appropriately so that the hospital is not losing money on that patient visit and that staffing is kept and equipment is bought so that the facility is profitable and they can put that money back into the facility depending on where you're working. Um, and so, well, let's talk about that. If the patient is inpatient, there is a set bed charge that the patient gets. Um, it's, it's billed by midnight. It's an odd system. I totally agree. But if the patient is in the bed at midnight, they get charged for that room at, um, for the 24-hour period. 
And so if they're on the floor bed, it is one charge. If they're in an ICU bed, it is a different charge because it's a different level of care. And with that bed charge, they can, achar they can charge for essentially your services as the nurse. Whether you're having to take care of the patient as one nurse to two patients, or you're taking care of the patient as one nurse to five or six patients. So there is two set charges. Well, in the ER, this one, two, three, four, and five is essentially how we charge for the bed charge. Because the patient that comes in in an acute cardiac arrest or in acute respiratory distress gets a different charge and costs more to the facility than the patient who comes in with a laceration to their finger and needs it sewn up. Those are two totally different ends of the spectrum. And if we charged everybody the same room charge that came into the ER, then the facility would lose money on patients that were your level one, level two patients if they were only getting a level four, level five charge. Does that make sense? So this triage system, back to a nurse at bedside who is now triaging, is determining what the patient is being charged for their room charge. That goes back to billing. Like, if there's anything that I don't want to get involved in, and that is Medicare and Medicaid billing. Do you know how many laws there are associated with the billing process? It is, we have teams of coders, we have teams that determine if it's an adequate charge or can be charged to these uh, government agencies. So with this triage system, remember you are also indirectly associated with the charging of that patient as well. So your level ones are your most acute, and it's really easy to follow the algorithm. Is the patient um, in a, need immediate life-saving intervention? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, they're a level one, and at that point, you just almost stop in the triage booth and take them all to a room, because that's all you need to know. Guess what? You can figure that out about the time they will in the door. You don't have to sit them down in a triage booth and put a cuff on them and check a temperature and know what their heart rate is to know if they need immediate life-saving intervention. That's pretty obvious. Um, two, so you answer no. So then you move to the next question. Is it a high-risk situation? Are they, is there an altered mental status? Are they in severe pain or distress? The answer is yes. There are two. If the answer is no, you move to number three. And this is interesting. How many different resources are needed? I'm glad they only put none, one, or many. Because outside of that, when you start thinking about billable resources, you have to understand that each bag of fluid is a billable resource. Each IV tubing is a billable resource. Each cath line that you use to attempt an IV is a billable resource. But a bedpan, a urinal, um, urine specimen cups, those are not billable resources. So you have to understand the difference in your facility and what are billable resources and what are not billable resources um, to get kind of through this number three. Thank goodness it says one, none, or many because if you're going to use more than one, then you're covered under many here. Um, but then you go to three, it also gives you danger zone vital signs. Which is nice because remember in the three, three level system, it just said unstable vital signs. It didn't really tell you what they were. It just gave you the gray area for you to make that decision. Here, it kind of gives you some specifics. Now, thank goodness they tend to be um, your pediatric patient, your age related um, unstable vital signs because our pediatric patient population is probably the ones that we see the least of in the ER. We see quite a few kids in, in emergency rooms, but we definitely see more adults than we do see children. Um, but it does give you heart rate and respiratory rate abnormals along <coughs> with SATs. So it does kind of give you some specifics, especially these age-related specifics with danger zone vital signs. So once you now have the patient identified as a one, two, three, four, five, now you get to go to your little stack of ones, or your little, well, usually your ones are in rooms, your twos or threes, and you get to go to this stack of threes and you go, okay, this patient's been in the lobby 45 minutes, this one's 
You go back and you look at vital signs. You go back and you look at chief complaints. You go back and look at how long have they been complaining. Is it an acute onset or has this been chronic for days? Um, and now you have to decide where you're going to put this patient in your stack of four, five, six, number threes that are already out in the lobby as well. So you have to be able to make that, that decision um, as you are assessing these patients in triage. Once we get to the assessment of the patient, you've been taught for the last four semesters, how do we assess a patient? Head to toe, right? Systematic. You start at the head, you finish at the toes, and you don't forget anything in between. Um, I'm going to teach you a new way to triage, a new way to assess. It's my favorite. It's the primary survey. I would probably never go back to just a traditional head to toe assessment. Why? Um, this primary assessment is geared to identify life-threatening injuries in the first five steps. Five steps and you correct it and you should stabilize your patient. Doesn't matter what's wrong with them. It doesn't matter what their cause is. It doesn't matter how they came in. Five steps and you should have the patient stabilized. Now, there's a lot to five steps to get them there, but five steps. And so we're going to talk about those. It's airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure are your five steps of your primary survey. A, B, C, D, and E. And we're going to cover all of those. A couple of things you need to know about the primary and secondary survey. And if you'll remember this, it will keep you straight. You never move to B until you have fixed A. You never move from you never move to C until you have fixed B. And you always start least invasive to most invasive. So it is systematic, it is methodical, and it, there is a plan laid out for you step by step to take care of these patients. It is this primary secondary survey. So airway is where we're going to start. Now, you notice beside it, it says cervical spine. What does that mean? That means that there are two ways to open an airway. If you suspect a C-spine injury, you will not do a head tilt chin lift on these patients. You'll do a jaw thrust instead, okay? But it is still airway first. All we did was change the way we opened the airway. So who are some of our patients that we might suspect a C-spine injury on? A motor vehicle accident, sure, a mechanism of injury could in initiate a C-spine injury. What else? Falls from large distances, diving this time of year, diving accidents, suspect a C-spine injury. Boating accidents, suspect a C-spine injury. Who else? We talked about another one. Electrical Our electrical burns, absolutely. Anybody that comes in with some type of electrocution, electrical burns, suspect a C-spine injury on the patient. All right, so now it comes down to assessing. We have to assess the airway. So when we talk about assessing airway, we are truly talking about just the physical opening from the external environment to the lungs. Is it open, the airway open? That is all we're looking at. We're not talking about breathing. We're not talking about chest rise and chest fall yet. We are physically talking about the passage of air from the external environment to the lungs. Is that available to the patient? Um, we can take this as simple as post-surgery patients. We talked about Miss Hamilton, our post-seizure patient. She was in that post phase of seizures um, in the video in Module C. That head flopped. She had that snoring respiration. That is an obstructed airway. Um, the patient who has surgery comes back from surgery and they're super sleepy, super drowsy. They have that soft palate drop. Those are obstructed airways. All the way to there can be a foreign object in an airway or the airway can be missing. Um, and we are talking about opening an airway. So we are really truly checking to see if they have an open airway. So how do we do that? What are some things that you're going to assess for? How do we know if the patient has an uh, unoccluded airway? They can talk. You have some type of breath sounds. You have you hear air moving. We'll let you know that you have some type of airway. Now they may not be breathing, but you may have an airway. But yes, 
some type of open airway. So there's lots of ways to open an airway for these patients. I keep wanting to open that drawer. Um, this is what I'm talking about when I say an airway that is missing. Um, we have lots of self-inflicted gunshot wounds. We have people that attempt suicide. Um, we will talk about suicide in Module E because we do have suicide attempts that come into our ER. <coughs> um, many times with suicides, it's guns, and they'll put the gun either at their chin or inside the mouth. What happens is they go to pull the trigger, and guess what? The gun moves. And so they'll, they'll take off part of their face. They'll take off part of their jaw. They'll take part of their airway. I did have a patient come in. Um, who was in a motor vehicle accident that had just blunt trauma to the face. Um, the only reason we found an airway is because there were um, blood bubbles gurgling at the neck is how we intubated the patient um, because of an airway issue. Um, so we do have where trauma in general will take away that airway for us. But remember, it is least invasive to most invasive that we, we unocclude an airway. So if we can do a head tilt chin lift and the airway opens, can we move on to breathing? Absolutely. Did we just take care of airway? Sure. We do a head tilt chin lift and there's still no air movement, then we might do something like a finger sweep. Have they just got a foreign object sitting in the airway? Or we may use some type of oral airway for the patient or a nasal airway for the patient. The most invasive way to protect an airway is an ET tube to intubate the patient. That is the most invasive way to protect an airway. Trach or ET tube, either one. But you're going to start least invasive and move to most invasive. If we're able to get an airway with, let's just say, a nasopharyngeal airway, can we move on to breathing? Yes. Is it a permanent way to open an airway? It is not. It's temporary. And at some point we will come back and we will um, intubate that patient. But initially, working through the primary survey, if you can open an airway with a head tilt chin lift, you can move on to breathing. Or if you can do a finger swift and open the airway, you can move on. Um, or if you can do a nasopharyngeal airway, you can move on but you know that you will come back and secure that, that airway. Once we have an airway, we move to breathing. Now, breathing, we have to slow down, and this is where we get one of our first vital signs. This is where we get their respiratory rate. So you have to listen to them for at least 15 to 30 seconds to get a respiratory rate on the patient. You have to make sure that you have symmetrical rise and fall of the chest. You have to look for things like paradoxal chest wall movement. You have to identify if they are missing breath sounds in any of their lung fields. One of the big reasons that we have ineffective breathing in patients is tension pneumothorax. Covered tension pneumos with Dr. DeBose in Module B, right? Yes. Yes. You just tested on it. I promise you, you did. All right, so tension pneumothorax is one of the biggest reasons that we have ineffective breathing in an emergency room patient. Trauma tends to be your cause, your cul culprit of a tension pneumothorax. So here's a patient who is losing breath sounds on one of their sides. If we don't identify the absent breath sounds and we move on to circulation in the primary survey, what's going to happen to the patient? They're going to deteriorate to cardiac arrest, absolutely. Um, so this is where it's so important to make sure that you have breath sounds in all of your lung fields, that you have symmetrical chest wall rise and fall, that you're not seeing that seesaw effect to one side of the chest wall, um, and that their rate is adequate. Three times a minute is not adequate. They may be breathing, but it's not enough to sustain life. They may be breathing, but they're breathing 80 times a minute. If they're breathing 80 times a minute, are they moving air? No, they're not. Um, so you have to make sure that the patient is breathing adequately. Again, 
once we assess the breathing and we identify a problem, we have to correct it. So here, we're only checking respiratory rate. We are not checking SATs. We don't check SATs until the secondary survey. You don't get your first full set of vital signs until the secondary survey. This is why when we preach assessment, 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 don't assess your monitor, assess your patient. This is why. Because you can identify all of this in the primary survey without knowing what a monitor says. You can look at a patient and know if they're hypoxic without having to put a SAT monitor on the patient to prove that they're hypoxic. You can identify if a patient is breathing adequately by assessing them, not waiting for labs to come back to prove that to you. So you have to assess your patient, not your monitor. That's why EMS uses this. Because it is designed for field work. It is designed for you to be away from the comforts of nursing in a hospital setting and take care of a patient. And you can do that by relying on what you identify in assessment. Where did y'all take assessment? What semester was that? First. First. You know what? You need assessment every semester of nursing school. Why? Because it is so important in taking care of the patient. We throw it at you first semester, and do you feel like you just survived first semester? Mm -hmm. Like, literally between assessment and pharmacology. pharmacology and your first clinical experience with um, fundamentals, do you feel like we just vomited nursing school all over you in the first semester, and you hope that you, you learned something? Assessment, I cannot stress to you how important your assessment is for these patients. Because you don't necessarily have the comforts of knowing a history, knowing how long they've been sick, having somebody work them up. This, you're starting from ground zero on these patients. And so we assess them. We identify that either they, they are or they are not breathing. We are looking for color. We are looking for chest wall movement. Um, we are looking for signs of your tension pneumothorax. What if the patient does have a tension pneumo? Okay, chest tube, but it's most invasive. Needle decompression is least in, less invasive than chest tubes. So remember, we work least invasive to most invasive. Patient's not breathing. An AMBU bag is less invasive than a vent. So least invasive to most invasive. So the patient didn't have an airway. We corrected it. They weren't breathing. We're bagging the patient effectively. We are seeing chest rise and chest fall with our bagging. Can we move on to circulation? Yes, we can. Have we corrected airway and breathing? Yes. Is it temporary? Yes. And we know that we're going to come back and intubate the patient and put them on a vent. But at the moment, we have corrected airway and breathing. We can move on. However, how easy is it to bag a patient? And then all of a sudden that bagging not be effective and we've lost an airway again. It is really easy. So that is why you're constantly reassessing what you're doing. That's constantly like, I've ba I'm bagging the patient, and, or I've got an airway and I'm bagging the patient. I've got to continually monitor for chest rise and chest fall on this patient to make sure that it's effective. Um, many people use what we call an EC hold for an AMBU bag, for the mouthpiece of an AMBU bag. I will be honest, I cannot hold an AMBU bag with an EC hold. My hands are not big enough. Now, my husband has no problem with it. But now he's 6'5", and his hand is about like this. Um, so he can hold an AMBU bag with an EC hold. Um, and it is literally your last three fingers, middle finger, ring finger, and pinky finger, go under the chin of the patient, and um, your thumb and pointer finger go to the top of the mask. Now, this EC hold is only effective if you're at the head of the bed. So guess what? Whoever is in control of the airway and breathing for the patient, where do they get to go? To the head of the bed. That is their position um, is to hold that airway and to bag for that patient. Now, me personally, I have to have two hands to make a seal on a bag. I have to use both hands to make that seal. So what does that happen? What does that leave for bagging? Somebody else. It takes two for me to bag a patient effectively. So remember, you have to have a team. Have you ever watched an ER work and a trauma patient comes in, that um, truly sick patient comes in, and you don't have one nurse at bedside? How many do you have? 
four, four, five, two techs, a physician, maybe two physicians. And all of a sudden, you're sitting there and you go, oh my gosh, that is overwhelming. The chaos that is going on in the room. It is really controlled chaos. It seems like it's chaotic, but did you know everybody in that room has a job and they know what it is? Because one, they work together. And so they, as a team, you won't find many areas of the hospital, and unfortunately, you don't see as much in the ER as you used to, but you won't find many teams that work as well together as an ER team. But two, they all know the primary secondary survey. So they all know priority. They all know that if I walk in the room and somebody is already bagging the patient, they've taken care of airway breathing, it might be my job to start an IV, which is in circulation. So everybody knows that survey so that when we get there, we're all following the same steps, but we've jumped in at different points because we know that if they are, have gotten to breathing, then airway's taken care of. I don't need to start there. Um, and so that is why ERs will look like chaos when there's really a lot of effectiveness to it because everybody knows what their role is. Um, bagging, by the way, that uh, BVM, bag valve mask, is effective. You can move on to circulation. Um, but again, breathing is where you get your first vital sign, which is your respiratory rate. I want to do that 25,000 times. And then we move to circulation. Circulation is where we get our next two vital signs. We get a heart rate here, and we get an estimated blood pressure. Remember, we have still not put a cuff on the patient when we get to circulation of the primary survey. So how do we know what their estimated pressure is? What is the purpose of circulation, by the way? Perfusion. The purpose of circulation is perfusion. So what do we really want to know? Are vital organs being perfused? That's all we want to know. We want to know, is their head, their lungs, their heart, maybe their kidneys being perfused? That's what we need to know. How do we know that? We assess those things, right? We assess their level of consciousness. We assess their heart rate. We assess, but we have to make sure that the pressure is high enough to perfuse them. So patients, especially with low pressures, you can spend 10 minutes trying to get a pressure on a patient. Um, I am still a huge believer in a, in a manual cuff. It will not fail you. Machines will fail you um, day in and day out. As a matter of fact, we had a patient just last week that got admitted for hypotension, was going to the unit for hypotension, no, hypertension, hypertension, and being started on NIPRIDE, and when we got to their unit, the pressure was 80 over 60 manually. Monitor had been reading 215 over 110 all day long. Did that patient need NIPRIDE? No. No. But that was a manual pressure versus a monitor pressure. Um, and the patient got admitted to the ICU because of hypertension. He wasn't hypertensive. And now he got a beer. Huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. He would have got moved out before midnight. But, yeah, absolutely. So manual pressures, when you can get manual pressures, but here's what we use. We use pulses to determine pressures. So if the patient has a carotid pulse that you can feel, you put your hands on the neck and you can feel a carotid pulse, they have a systolic of at least 60. If you check femoral and you can feel a femoral pulse, they have a systolic of 70. And if you check radial and they have a radial pulse, they have a systolic of 80. Guess what? A systolic of 80 equals perfusion. Perfusion. I don't need to worry about anything else if I have a radial pulse. Now, do they still need fluids? Probably so. Absolutely. Not saying that we don't need to still treat probably the hypovolemia that's going on or the sepsis that's going on that this patient has a pressure in the 80s. But if you have a radial pulse, you have perfusion to vital organs. So we check pulses. Now, how fast was that compared to finding a manual cuff 
and checking a pressure and knowing if they're truly being perfused. However, it's limited, right? That was just limited on the hypotensive um, side of the patient, right? 60, 70, and 80, we're just looking at <laughs> systolics for perfusion. But this is where we check that. We check heart rates and we check an estimated blood pressure on the patient. This is also where if we have hemorrhaging, we control the hemorrhaging. So this is kind of a two-step process. You have the stopping the bleeding and replacing what the patient has lost. So kind of rule of thumb, patients had two liters of isotonic fluids, normal saline, lactated ringers, and their heart rate's still greater than 100, and their pressure's still less than 90, we need to swap from fluids to what? Yeah. Do it now. Blood products. We need to go to blood products. Have we drawn labs on this patient? Nope. Can we give blood? Yes, we can. What do we give them? O oh, negative. That's right. Do you know how many times I've called the blood bank before the patient ever arrived? Never laid eyes on them and said, I need an emergency pack for this patient. What do they give me? They give me a cooler full of blood. They don't like to, but they do it. And it's all manual paperwork, and you sign it out. And as long as you haven't taken it out of the cooler, it can be returned. Take it out of the cooler, you got 30 minutes to hang it. There's protocols. There's, there's um, limits to that blood. But I can call the lab, I can get that blood, and I can have it had, sitting at bedside when EMS wheels in the door with the patient. And if I don't need it, great, I take it back. If I do need it, I've already got it at bedside. We can give O negative to these patients. We haven't drawn labs on them. We don't draw labs until the secondary survey. But I can give blood right here. Two liters of isotonic fluids, and they're not responding. We swap to blood products. Both expand volume. So why do we go to blood versus still pumping them full of saline or lactated ringers? They both will cause perfusion. If we get volume up, we'll perfuse it. So why do we go to blood? What is the difference in blood and saline? Blood carries oxygen that saline does not. So we can refuse volume all day long, but if it can carry an oxygen, guess what? Patient's still hypoxic. We still have organ death. We still have tissue death. We still have organ failure on the patients. So we have to swap to something that has hemoglobin in it. We gotta have some, some red blood cells there. We got to be able to perfuse oxygen to the patient. So two liters, we swap to blood products. So IVs, the patient needs at minimum two large bore IVs. And actually, we probably need to start with stopping the bleeding first. So let's start, start with the controlling the bleeding. Um, again, least invasive to most invasive. The patient has a arm that's amputated. Can we hold manual pressure on it? We can, is it gonna work? No, you have to take into consideration what you've got. If you've got a radial artery shooting across the room, holding manual pressure on it's doing no good for anybody. You have to move to a tourniquet. Um, but it's least invasive to most invasive. So I, I've cut my thumb open, cutting open a bell pepper as a child because, you know, I was independent and I was going to do it and not let mom help. And so I had this nice big gash from one side of my thumb to the other. At home, what can I do? Manual pressure, elevate it, pressure dressing. I go to the ER and they put stitches in it, right? So least invasive to most invasive. Arms amputated. They get caught in a piece of equipment, farming equipment, and the arm is detached. They come in the ER. Are we just going to tell them to hold manual pressure? No. no. We're going to amputate or we're going to put a tourniquet on that arm. Now. We talked about, no, we haven't either. We haven't gotten to snake bites yet. In snake bites, when we get to snake bites, we're going to talk about constrictive bands and the difference between constrictive bands and tourniquets. What is the goal of a tourniquet? Stop. To stop blood flow. So if we are stopping blood flow, what is happening distally to that tourniquet? 
tissue death, right? So we are taking into consideration the lack of perfusion distally once we put a tourniquet on a patient. When we talk about snake bites, we're going to talk about constrictive bands, and they are not designed to stop blood flow. They are designed to slow lymphatic flow or uptake of venom. But when we put a tourniquet on a patient, our intention is to stop blood flow. Now, um, when we put a tourniquet on a patient, we also need to identify what time we put that tourniquet on the patient. Because there is a window of, sometimes we can see clotting occur, and we can reduce these tourniquets and still restore blood flow distally and save an extremity. So you really also want to know a time that you put tourniquets on patients. I had a um, boy, he was about, I guess he was 14. It was a Sunday afternoon. He was riding his dirt bike and got his leg hung on something um, and it ended up in the back wheel of his dirt bike. He wrecked and essentially his right foot when he came in from just above the ankle looked like it was really truly detached from his body. Um, the only thing that looked like it was holding it on was the jeans that he was wearing. To the point that it had so much dirt and grass and ants and mud in it that I went to pick up what I thought was a stick, it was part of his leg bone, um, is how bad that, that it was impacted with mud. Um, he was hovering. When I tell you uh, to be 14 years old and he had a pressure in the 60s, his heart rate was 150s, he was breathing 30 times a minute, um, we were pumping fluids to him, we had pumped blood to him, we were doing everything that we could to save his life over a limb. We had a tourniquet on him. It was not stopping, it had stopped arterial flow, but it had not stopped the venous oozing that was occurring. Um, of course, it's Sunday, we have to call orthopedics in. They're dragging ass, no one wants to come in, trying to get somebody to take this child to the OR. Um, and Dr. Bass at the time, he's been gone a while, but Dr. Bass at the time, um, went and got a surgical tray and started clamping in that leg. Anything that he could find that was oozing, anything that he could find that was bleeding, he started clamping. And about six clamps in, all of a sudden, our fluids and our blood was making a difference in the patient. So here we were, he had an airway, he was breathing, we were trying to stop the blood, we were replacing volume, and it took about six clamps, and all of a sudden his pressure started coming up, his heart rate started coming down, and I say coming up, like we were in the 90s. Heart rate was like 120s versus 150s. We were seeing a change in him. Um, orthopedics got there and there was this nice discussion outside the patient's room between orthopedics and the ER physician as to why was he using clamps? He had just destroyed the blood supply and the blood flow to that leg and he wasn't gonna be able to attach the foot. What was the ER doctor's rationale for it? He is alive. He is alive. I hate it that you can't reattach the foot. That's not my problem. My job was to keep him alive, and guess what I've done? And so the boy went to the OR. They were re able to reattach that foot, and he walked back into that ER about four months later um, with his foot in intact, which we all thought he would lose it. I'd never in a million years thought he would keep that foot um, from about the ankle down. But again, here, here you are with an ER physician that a tourniquet had not stopped blood flow completely. It was life over limb for that patient. So you have to have that mindset when you put a tourniquet on these patients. You have to have that mindset when your physician starts clamping arteries because that is potentially that this 14 year old would have been without the lower part of his leg. Um, but that is what we, what we do. We, not only do we stop blood flow, but we replace. Now it's tough to identify um, a loss of blood many times in abdomen. We have abdominal traumas, we have pelvic traumas, and these patients will absolutely bleed out into the abdomen and it can be hard to find. Now Dr. Godwin, she could lose a single drop of blood in her abdomen and it would expand and be hard as a rock. Me, you could lose all of my blood flow into my abdomen and you'd never find it. Like, it just depends on the size of the patient as to how soon you're going to see blood in the abdomen. So be mindful of that, if you have a patient that you do not see external bleeding on, but hemodynamically everything points to loss of volume, the patients lose the volume. Now, is it in their GI tract? Because they hide it very well there. 
um, GI tract, and they just haven't started vomiting up the blood yet. They haven't started having the frank blood in the stools yet. Is it in their GI tract? Is it abdominal trauma? Is it pelvic trauma? Um, so if they are looking like they are not perfusing, again, on that assessment, trust your assessment. They're probably not perfusing. You've got to find out where the bleeding is coming from. Um, and so one of the things that we, uh, there are lots of different products that are on the market that can be used to cause coagulation. Um, we used to use some sprays. They now make little pads you can put on. They work very well on that road rash type bleeding. That it's, dis it's just diffuse, it's everywhere, but there's not any one area you can really sew, close up, stop the bleeding. Um, they make lots of different sprays. They make lots of different pads that you can put on the patient. A lot of our emergency medicine techniques actually comes from, unfortunately, war. Comes from our uh, military side. Um, we, they try it in combat, it works, and they bring it back to the civilian world, and we use it in our emergency medicine. Xstat is one of those, and it's pretty cool. I was going to just show it to you. It works well for things like gunshot wounds. This revolutionary new device can remove up to 10 times more earwax than a traditional cotton swab. Latest studies show that cotton swabs are not good. Every drop of blood on the battlefield is precious. The faster you can stop the bleeding, the higher probability that you'll save that guy's life. There's always the common theme with the medicine, improving technology. XStat is a first-in-time medical device designed to stop bleeding from small, narrow entrance wounds like a gunshot wound. You quickly, you take the device, you literally plunge it into the wound or the bullet hole, and you shoot the sponges into the wound. As soon as they come into contact with blood, they rapidly expand and, and fill up the wound and compress it to get the bleeding and stop. They are pretty neat. See the little blue X or cross or T or whatever you want to call it on the end of that X stat? What is that? It is radio pain. Why do they put them there? So you can identify them. So that when you put these in a, in a patient and it stops the bleeding, because remember they're designed for a gunshot wound, some type of impalement, something that's um, narrow entry, then when they get to the OR and we've got to clean that area out, we want to make sure we get all these sponges out. So on x-ray, all they got to do is take an x-ray of that area, and if the sponge is still there, that little x shows up, little cross shows up. With the current standard on the battlefield, taking three to five minutes to tackle wound, the soldiers lose a tremendous amount of blood. One of the real innovations behind the x stat is that it's self-compressing, meaning that it expands from within the wound. What you normally have to do to get the bleeding to stop with a traditional dressing is apply compression from outside the wound and hope that that force or that compression gets to the side of bleeding. What XDAT does is it expands in the wound and compresses outward, so it makes sure it gets all the potential sites of bleeding in the wound. And it works within seconds. And because it's compressing the wound, the medic doesn't have to, and essentially the treatment's done at that point. All my friends are still on active duty. They're still deploying to combat. What drives me is to continue to make new products to help them on the battlefield that, from my own personal experience, I think are better products and will save lives on the battlefield. So just a cool product that is used um, for narrow entry wounds. Um, we see a lot of gunshot wounds. Not in this area as much as there are other areas of the country that have high instances of gunshot wounds um, where something like XSAT can be very effective um, to, to keep the patient alive. Like he had mentioned, it is self-compressing. What does that do? It frees up the hands of somebody there that's at, at bedside with them, that is there taking care of them. So you're no longer having to put a manual pressure or to see if you can get that tourniquet tight enough to stop the bleeding when you've got it actually sitting there pressing on the vessel itself to stop bleeding, um, which is pretty cool. Talk about two large IVs to replace fluids. Um, 20 gauges are not considered large or bore IVs. 
Most ERs are going to frown on 18 gauges. When we say large IVs, we mean 16s, 14s. We are talking large diameter IVs on these patients. These patients many times need central lines. They need some type of line that you can put large volumes into. Um, a 20, an 18 and 20 gauge is not big enough to get the volume into these patients that they need. Um, if you have not seen orange and gray, they're your friends. So you know how 18s are green and 20s are pink. You have orange and gray that are your friends when, you, when you're talking about emergency large bore IVs. Um, disability. When you hear disability, I want you to automatically think the neurological status of the patient. We are talking about the mental capacity of the patient when we talk about disability. So you may hear things called like AVP or U. They're alert, they're responsive to voice, responsive to pain, or unresponsive. Hopefully you get a GCS score with it. That'd be great. Um, again, you don't have to know the um, Glasgow Coma Scale. You just have to realize that 15 is your highest, um, and hopefully they're somewhere between 13 and 15 is ideal. When you start talking less than eight, we have got severe deficits in the patient. Um, and then pupil size and reactivity. I know I have preached all semester long in head to toe assessments. I'm sure everybody in my clinical groups is tired of me asking what the pupil size of the patient is. Like, I should just have that stamp instead of having to write it out. Because when we talk about reactivity and if they're equal, we need to know a size. That tells us a lot. Um, it lets us know about intracranial pressure. If they are on drugs, it lets us know something about what drug they might be on if we've got dilated pupils or if we've got pinpoint constricted pupils. Um, so size, responsive to light, and if they're equal is the big ones we want to know about pupils. But when we think disability, think neurologically. There are lots of things that can alter the mental status of the patient. An ER patient that comes in, tell me something that can alter the mental status. Who comes in confused? UTIs. UTIs in our elderly patients. Absolutely, they come in confused. Are they, do they have an airway? Are they breathing and do they have circulation? So we hit disability and now they're confused. Usually they are mean. Like, they'll take the skin off your arms if you're not careful, especially those little elderly women. They have grips that you had no clue that they had. And all of a sudden, those little frail legs can kick you across the room. So they can be, di they can be disoriented because of infection. Why else can we have a disoriented uh, patient? Hypoxia is another one. The patient is confused because they are lacking oxygen to the brain. So now, why are they lacking oxygen? Is it a perfusion problem? Or is it the fact that um, a volume perfusion problem? Or is it a fact that they've had a stroke and there's a lack of perfusion to the brain? So now you have to look at what's causing the perfusion issue in the patient. All right? So infection, hypoxia, what else? Ammonia, renal failure patients, they come in all the time with ammonia levels that are elevated or liver failure patients, they'll have ammonias that are elevated. What else? Drugs. Drugs. We see a lot of drug use. Like to the point of, we don't even care, just tell us what you're taking so that we can take care of you. I'm not the police, I'm the nurse. Like I just want to take care of you, I don't care what you're on. Supervising this last week. Had a gentleman that security was wanting to call Dothan PD on in the ER. I walked down there and talked to the man. The first thing he did was get out of the chair, raise his hands, and ask me not to take him to jail. Dude, I'm not here to take you to jail. I'm trying to find out what kind of medical help you need. Sure enough, he owned up to illicit drug use. And that's why he was there, to get help for illicit drug use. He was pacing. Did he need to go to the jail? Nope. Was he disruptive to the rest of the ER? He made him a little uncomfortable, but he was walking back and forth in front of the vending machine. He was hungry, he didn't have any money. And he, there was a vending machine there. He was walking back and forth in front of it. So drug use is another one. We see patients that are confused all the time for drug use. Um, 
and they'll hesitate on telling you what they're using because they're afraid that we're going to turn them in when in reality, we really just want to take care of them. Like, we just need to know what you are on so we know what we can give you to treat you. What else can cause confusion in a patient? So we've talked about hypoxia, we've talked about drugs, we've talked about infection. Like a low sodium? Sodiums, absolutely. Have you ever taken care of a patient with a low sodium? First of all, it takes a while to get them up. You can't change them overnight. And yes, they'll come in confused. I had a patient in the height of COVID who came in who had a, so, a sodium of 114. Like, it was low. You know, he was confused for three weeks even after we got his sodium up. Took three weeks for the mental status to, to clear up from a low sodium. Even after his sodium was up. So yeah, low sodiums. So those are all the things that we have to think about when these patients come in confused. Um, that's why I love the ER. You get to be detective. You get to figure out what's going on. The boy part's treating it. Like figuring it out is the fun part. And then you stabilize them and you let somebody else take care of them long term. It's nice to call the floor weeks later and go, hey, did they make it out or home or discharged or what happened? All right, and then in the primary survey, we have exposure or environmental control. The big one here is hypothermia. When we talk about body temperature, patients do not metabolize drugs well when they're cold. They, the metabolism slows. So we want to make sure that these patients um, stay warm. We don't want to see slow, thick, sludgy blood because it affects perfusion. We want that blood to stay warm and flowing very well. Um, and so we want to keep their body temperature up. Guess what that means for you? You get sweat. You are going to get uncomfortable. Because when you truly have these trauma patients coming in, you need a room temperature somewhere between 75 and 80 degrees. That is miserably warm when you're working on them. Not counting if you have to glove up, gown up, mask up to take care of them. But the room should be 75 to 80 degrees. Why? Why do we need the room so warm? What are we going to do? We're going to cut their clothes off of them. They're exposed to body, the room temperature, just laying there on the stretcher. They're missing volume. We're putting fluids in them. We start giving them um, lactated ringers or normal saline. Where does it come from? It's cool. It's the shelf yeah. in the room, which has been 60 to 65 degrees, and we're pumping two liters of fluid in them. So what's happening to that core temperature? It's, it's dropping. All right, well, fluids wasn't enough, so we swapped to blood products. Blood came from the freezer. They thawed it enough for us to get it into them, and now their body temperature drops even further. So when their temperature drops, blood gets thick and sludgy. We lose perfusion. We lose metabolism. We lose the ability to absorb and use the drugs that we are giving them. So we have to keep them warm. Ways that we can do that. We warm our rooms, least invasive, right? Because that's not even touching the patient. Um, we use heat lamps. We use bear huggers. We use warming blankets. We use warm fluids, warm blood. That's what you see over here to the right. That is a blood warmer. And so essentially it just connects to your IV tubing and the blood runs through this little packet and it, it looks kind of like a Ziploc bag, if you want to call it that. It has channels. And that's kind of like a toaster. And you stick the packet into the toaster, and it warms from the top and the bottom. So as the blood and the fluids are running through this little um, Ziploc bag, it's warming them before it goes into the patient. You can put all of it on the warmer. You can put blood on the warmer. You can put fluids on warmers. And now you're getting the body fluids uh, you now you're getting fluids going into the core of the body much warmer than if you were getting them out of the cooler or off the shelf and putting in the patient. Um, may need to check core temperatures. There's several ways you can check core temperatures. 
Rectally is probably the easiest. You can put a rectal probe in the patient and get a core temperature. You can also get them off of Foley catheters. You can also get them off um, esophageal probes. So you can take essentially what is a um, temperature probe and instead of inserting it rectally, you can put it in the esophagus and get a core temperature on the patient. So um, several ways to get core temperatures, but when you talk about exposure, environmental control, you're really thinking about warming the patient. Um, you also have to be mindful of what the patient may expose you to as well. Um, the only difference between an ER patient and um, what's going on outside of the ER is the double doors that stops the patient from walking in. So anything that is occurring outside the facility can occur inside the facility as well. Um, we have had patients um, not too long ago, I had a patient who was beaten to what the guy thought was death. He thought he would killed her intentionally. Um, somebody found her in a ditch, brought her in. She was in our ICUs and she had been there about three weeks and he got wind that she was still alive. Guess who started showing up during visiting hours trying to find her to finish her off? To kill her. We had to move the patient um, and lock the facility down because he was coming back to finish the job that he had not successfully done the first time. We have pe people show up. We have drugs in the ER all the time. We have, unfortunately, guns, knives, anything you want a name in the ER. Um, we'll talk about the ER being a high place of workplace violence. Um, I had a patient one time who was on the backboard. He'd been brought in. He was drunk. He'd been in a car wreck. And he was super pleasant. He really was being very nice. Um, and we were, I was cutting his shirt off and I'd let my guard down because he was super nice and I was talking to him and getting information. And about that time, he pulled out a switchblade and flipped it open um, on me. And he came about that far from my right cheek. He was trying to help me cut his shirt off. He was going to, instead of me using the scissors that I had, he was going to cut his shirt off with the, with the switchblade he pulled out of his pocket. The problem was is... He had lost con concept of where my face was in comparison to his knife and the shirt that was on his body. Um, was it intentional? No. But could I have been hurt? Absolutely. And so you have to keep up this awareness of what is around you um, even when you feel like there's no harm intended with the patient, especially these little elderlies that come in um, with our little UTIs, infections, and they are sick. Um, their intention may not, well, sometimes their intention is to hurt you. They're confused. <laughs> but they, they can cause some damage before you get a control of a limb or you can get them settled back down. So just be mindful of also your environment when we talk about exposure. We're going to stop right there. We're going to take about 10 minutes, and then we will come back and start on the secondary survey.